Hey, it's Match Raider from Score the Podcast. This is a little bonus conversation we had with Christoph Beck, talking about his love for modular synths and the changing form of film music, uh, plus his first live performance in Holland and uh, a movie he just completed called Twelfth Man. It's fun to actually be back in this room and see that, Chris, we were talking about just a moment ago, it's different because there is an enormous amount of gear that wasn't here the last time I was here. What are all those buttons and wires over here? Well, I think of them as a collective more than a bunch of individual pieces of gear. Mm. That is my modular synth. Um, Modular synthesis is something I've been obsessed with for 15, 20 years. Um, I kind of fell away from it for a while, and then a few years ago uh, rediscovered my love for it. And um, it's just a, a, a really amazing and uh, hands-on way of making music that um, invites experimentation and that really uh, exercises the computer programmer part of my brain. Um, and I'm just fascinated with uh, what you can do with it. Of course, it's uh, it's completely uh, inappropriate for film composing because it's so ephemeral. Anytime you have created a patch, especially a complex one, on that machine, um, you need to seize the moment and capture what you can because as soon as you unpatch it, it's gone forever. Um, and of course, in film composing, we need to be able to respond to requests you know can we go back three versions and um if uh i had to do that on that machine it would be well i would have to just say no we can no we cannot and and for Um, and for those listening if you haven't seen one of these it looks like a flight control deck for how long does it take you to to learn the ins and outs of everything on that well I'm, i'm i'm always learning i i probably um should know all the different pieces of that a lot better than i do um but it if you, uh, as a musician or composer, are familiar with a regular synthesizer, you know, with a keyboard and then a panel attached to it with some switches and knobs, it's basically the same thing, only with all the insides exposed so that you can reconnect it and basically redesign the instrument as you're working with it. Um, so if you start with those fundamentals of basic analog synthesis, you're well on your way. Science! I think... <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I think you, you actually answered part of my questions which is i mean first of all i'm the guy who really likes having a keyboard and a button that says saxophone you know even if it's a horrible sounding saxophone at least i can get the sound up (laughs) is there any other kind and i can go back (laughs) i can go back to it you said just curiously you said not practical for film composing which begs the question are you doing other composing in addition to film composing or is this simply kind of you know your hobby when you're not doing film composing it has been my hobby but it is now becoming thankfully and very happily a little bit less of a hobby um i recently just did my first ever live performance in holland on this instrument super as, cool as part of a um you might say a very european style uh, uh installation as part of a music festival in utrecht where they had eight modular synthesizer artists including me and four uh, multimedia visual artists, all in a giant warehouse. Mm. Um, anyone who's interested in checking it out can just check out my social media, and you'll see lots of pictures and videos from my recent trip. Um, and basically each of us, including the visual guys, set up a patch that was self-running mm. and that we just let run all day. And people kind of came in and wandered around from synth to synth to check out people's work um my synth uh setup had uh i wanted it to be interactive so i set up a few buttons and sliders for people to play with and um it was it was awesome to see people interact with it um especially well there were really two kinds of people who were there well let's say three one was um people who understood what it was and maybe they're musicians themselves and they're just kind of looking i could tell they were just checking it out to see like how it was doing what it was doing and then a whole other group were people who've never really had the experience of physically interacting with a piece of music before. And that feeling of being inside the music um, and being able to control it is, as I'm sure, Robert, I'm sure you know, um, and maybe you guys have experienced it as well, it's magical. Visceral. Yeah. If, if you've never done it before, just the smiles on people's faces uh-huh, was totally yeah. rewarding. And the third group was kids. 
and they went bananas. That's right cool. on. Yeah. yeah. Well, when it's you, like those toy, like a kid's toy. There's all these little things to move, and it changes the sounds, and your brain's stimulating, and you're creating on the fly like that. That's yeah. really Did cool. Did this gear go with you? Well, you can see there's a bunch of holes in it. Yeah. <laughs> those are the pieces that came with me. I couldn't uh, bring all of it with me. That, uh, that would be pure insanity. But I have um, I have a couple of portable cases, and I, I set up a, a special, uh, you know, specially curated selection of modules to bring with so me. So this is like I, a yeah a musical museum, or not museum, but like an art exhibit, but but interactive for people. Interactive, yeah. Uh, the visual artist guys had some really interactive stuff. Like there was one, um, there was one setup where if you stood in this kind of taped off circle and then tilted your body this way or that way, this projection of abstract images would shift with you as well as the sound. Wow! And it was completely wild. Oh man, yeah. that's truly interactive. I do wonder, and certainly getting to the film part of your career, if this does influence i mean the next score you do how would you not be tempted to sort of step oh it's over hard to this gear <laughs> it's hard like you know uh disney family comedy hey why don't we do an abstract electronic <laughs> synth score you know what <laughs> i think you could really be setting some new territory loose here um and probably that's what i wouldn't be surprised you you think about how film score has evolved would anybody have thought of certain kinds of approaches to movies that happen? You know, you think it's always going to be orchestral and European orchestras doing tension and comedy, and it does evolve. I, maybe 15 years from now, you see Cinderella 9 with some Tron. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Tron meets Cinderella. Tron Dorella. <laughs> well, it, it actually is totally within the realm, the realm of possibility because there are virtual versions of this coming out all the time, getting better. Um, to me, there's nothing that quite replaces the physical activity of plugging in a cable and turning a knob versus moving a mouse around and looking at a screen. Um, but I will say one of the things that uh, was part of this exhibit in Utrecht was a modular synth that was contained in a 3D virtual reality world. And you put on the glasses hmm. and the headphones and you hold these um, controllers in each hand and you can grab virtual modules from like a bin over here and put them in a 3d space you know up down left right towards you away from you and you connect them also virtually and uh, that melted my face i mean that <laughs> that cool. was unbelievable and i'm not necessarily predicting that that's going to be the interface we all use as film composers i don't know how practical that is although it's an enormous amount of fun but as the virtual emulations of this stuff get better, just as they're getting better with fake orchestras, um, then you know that kind of solves the repeatability problem because you can just hit save. And it makes me think about how, um, just how not only film composers will approach composing in the future, but you know, you think about uh, while you were speaking, I thought about first Jerry Goldsmith's banging on mixing yeah. balls. You know, who would have thought that a movie about Planet of the Apes would end up using, I mean, how analog can you be? You're banging on a bowl. Or, or, or the amazing uh, tape echo or echoplex or whatever he used on the trumpet in Patton. Yeah. Also, I thought about Chariots of Fire and how here's a 1924 movie, was that it? Where a guy's using a kind of sequenced electronic thing. So Tron Darella <laughs> yeah, yeah. may actually be kind of analog but you can, yeah. I mean, and if I may plug a little bit of my own work, I just finished a movie called Twelfth Man, which is a World War II movie in uh, Norwegian language and, and made in Norway. Um, and the director was very interested in my electronic work. And so um, while there is a pretty predominant orchestra in the score, um, it just as predominant is the electronic part of it. And it doesn't feel anachronistic. Can you tell us more about that score, how you did it, and the movie Twelfth Man? I read the title, but know very little. Sure, sure. Um, this is and an amazing story, actually. Is there any in English? Is it subtitled? There's a little bit of English, but everyone is speaking in the language that they would have been speaking in. Sure. Which is uh, my favorite way of seeing World War II movies, rather than everybody speaking English with a British accent. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, I did a film... I did a couple films uh, in the Pink Panther series mm -hmm. way back when with Steve Martin 
The second film I did was directed by Harold Zwart. Mm. Um, and this was now, I don't know, 16, 17 years ago. And I remember at the rap party, I've always been interested in World War II. I've always wanted to do a war movie. Mm. And um, one of my favorite books, I was an avid reader um, of World War II history books, was called We Die Alone, I believe. And it's the story of a Norwegian commando who uh, escaped Norway after the Germans invaded and then got together with a bunch of his compatriots in the UK. And then they came back on a boat intending to um, do some guerrilla warfare, just harass the Germans, blow up a boat here and there, whatever. But it went horribly wrong. And they got caught before they even landed in their boat. And all but one were captured. Mm. So this one guy who was not captured, he, I mean, the movie is his story. It's a survival story. Um, he spent the next several months. Is he the 12th man? He's the 12th man. Right. So 11 got captured and killed. And then he had to escape to uh, Sweden, which was neutral at the time. Mm. Uh, and the Germans wouldn't follow him into Sweden, but they followed him all the way there as he trekked on foot in the dead of winter, um, undergoing all kinds of crazy, crazy ordeals. And his story is now like iconic and part of the national culture mm -hmm. in the way that, you know, Custer's Last Stand might be for Americans. Oh, yeah. And so you said you blended orchestral and before i get to that yeah let me finish the story because it's, it's it is a an amazing you're selling hollywood. movie tickets here <laughs> yeah, so we're going <laughs> it's an amazing uh, hollywood story with a happy ending which yeah. is very rare um so uh, we were at the premiere party i think and um i told him you know like i realized he was norwegian i was like oh my god you know hey do you know about this book and this story and he's his eyes lit up and he said that is a movie i've wanted to make my whole life and wow. you know i don't know if i'm ever going to get to make it but if i do i'm going to call you amazing and so this is 15, pink panther time yeah oh yeah yeah god. yeah so way back when and no, you know uh, from a um from a traditional studio executive standpoint you know i was just the comedy guy right so 15 years later 16, um, I get a phone call and he kept his promise. Like he called me to do his World War II movie when he finally got a chance to do his dream passion project. That's awesome. That, it, it's so rare that that, that happens in Hollywood. Ending. Yeah. Thanks for subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And thanks for telling a friend about the show and helping us continue to grow.